Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Happy New Year for 2024 and all that kind of thing. Uh, today we're taking a look at something a little bit different on here because there's no radios in sight. But this time we've got some catalogues and books from the 1990s. So I've just been doing a bit of a clear out in my garage over the uh, festive period whilst I've had some time off work. And I stumbled across these catalogues and it just made me think, wow, is it really that long ago? I mean... Um, I got into CB radio back in the early 1990s because um, I was a teenager back in those days. It's quite some time ago now, but uh, it was 1991, I think, or 92, that I got my first uh, two-channel CB handled, which was made by Altai, I think it was. So that's going back some years now, but can you believe, like, 30 years have gone by? And, um, yeah, I, I pulled these catalogues out and I was looking through them. Uh, some CB radio equipment and some ham radio stuff and uh, it's crazy to think it's uh, such a long time ago it doesn't seem two minutes but um, yeah I've been on all that time and uh, whilst I was a bit too young to be on in the 1980s my time on the CB was around the uh, early 1990s I think it was 91 but um, yeah that's when I first got into it and it's all been uh, history since then really so anyway, I've managed to keep these catalogues all these years, and um, these go back, like I say, to uh, around the mid-90s, some of them. I think this one's 1992, which is probably the oldest one I could find. I've got a Knights one somewhere from Knights CB in the UK, who are still around to this very day. Obviously not maybe as big as they used to be, uh, because they've recently moved to online only, but uh, they did have a physical shop as well, which is still in existence, but you've got to make an appointment to go through. But... Um, the other main competitor to Knights, it was a big one back in the 90s, was of course uh, Nevada and Waters and Stanton and a few other places like that. But particularly for CB radio, there was a company called Truck King and uh, these were in Watford in the UK. And an awful lot of you out there who are my age or probably older will have remembered Truck King uh, quite fondly. Um, they did sell a hell of a lot of CB radio gear and they had some really good stuff. I never actually got a chance to go through to the... Uh, physical premises but um yeah i always did the mail order and this is before the internet don't forget as well because um in the early 90s there was no World Wide web or anything like that it wasn't until later on in the 90s that shops started to turn to online um so i mean yeah you know some of the early adopters would have been around uh, 96 97 perhaps online but uh, a lot of them didn't follow until the uh, sort of 2000s really but anyway, um, Truck King was one of the big ones and sadly no longer with us. I think they uh, shut down about maybe 15 years ago now it must be. So I can remember them closing down, but um, due to uh, you know competition from other online retailers, they couldn't compete anymore and they decided to uh, throw the towel in, so to speak. But um, yeah, this catalogue here is I think 92, 93. And um, I used to buy uh, these catalogues every now and again. They used to produce one every year or two. And uh, yeah, really impressive. Um, you don't get catalogues like this anymore, obviously, because of the internet. And um, yeah, let's have a look inside it. There's some really good stuff going back. Uh, I mean, you think this is what? Uh, almost 30 years ago. So uh, look at these rigs in here, these Midlands and things like that. And look at the price of them as well. When you, when you think in real terms, CB radios have come down in price in some respects because you can get a lot more for your money these days than some of these radios would have been. But I mean... A UK 40s, like the straight 40 FM radios. And then, of course, um, the uh, CB handles, like the Jessans, or G-San. Never was quite sure how to pronounce it. It's the KT750, there you go. And some of these other radios. But uh, the Midland Porter Pack, which is obviously very famous. Lots and lots of people had them in the UK. Still still going strong today, if you can find a good one. They fetched some good money on eBay, but they were 89 95 back in 92. So uh, really interesting stuff there. Uh, let's just uh, flick through onto some of these. Oh uh, yeah, I remember Skip Tech as well. Skip Tech brand, eighty nine ninety five for the Skip Tech four four thousand FM, the Alpha four thousand, which was based on the Rotel two forty, one hundred and forty five quid. So it was quite an expensive uh, UK uh, radio just for a forty channel FM rig. So in real terms, radios have come down in price since a lot of the Chinese manufacturers got onto the scene. Then there's the Donita. Uh, Mark 5, 115 quid, and the Maxcom 20E for 69.95 down there. Um, obviously, these were only 40 channel radios in most cases. There was one or two 80 channel rigs as well, but um, yeah, I mean, just look at these and look at the prices. Uh, but yeah, Danita, if I remember rightly, Danita radios were those ones with the rubbery knobs. I used to have one of their uh, CB handles, which was quite an interesting one as well. 
they uh they were very uh, distinctive design let's just say but um yeah well, look at this radio down here the scanner 40 fm as well pr 27 gb if anyone remembers that you could get a 40 channel cpt model which is the same as the fcc uh, 40 mid block channels look at the price is 159 pounds and you think today what you can buy for much much less money than that so you know some prices since the 1990s have actually uh, come down quite a lot and you do get a lot more for your money if i just uh, flip into this a little bit um there's quite a few i mean look, there's a whole page of uh, cb handholds there as well like the dnts um i remember the dnts in fact dnt used to uh have a bit of a reputation um in fact they became known as does not transmit and that's what they said dnt standard for <laughs> because of the amount of uh, failures on that particular brand at one time but yeah the cat's cold whisker that was a very uh very expensive kind of uh, system, but quite unique at the time. I remember that one. Then up here on this other side of the page, we've got the Maxon uh, 49 megahertz headsets, which were an alternative to CB radio. Um, up to about a quarter of a mile range. They used to use crystals inside them, I think. And they were £69 for a pair of them. And basically, this was before PMR446, and a lot, lot lower range to a, the... the, the um, power was about in the milliwatts i think on these ones they weren't very expensive weren't very uh, powerful at all really uh, look new design for 92 <laughs> but yeah so oh, there you are that's the sonic e07 now that's basically the first walkie-talkie that i bought from a car boot cell that got me into cb radio channel 14 and channel 30 absolutely crazy and that's what started it all off for me just buying two of those and uh, soon getting fed up of having just two channels I migrated to a 40 channel um, Harvard CB handle, but that came much, much after. But um, Roger Beat boards, things like that, um, that you could fit inside radios to do the things like the high gain beeps, telescopic antennas, NICAD batteries. Jeez, I'm just going to flick through this a bit. There's lots of components, there's so much in these catalogs. They were so um, comprehensive back then. Some of these antennas, though, haven't really changed much since the 90s. I mean, like, there's the Serio GPS uh, 27, like, half waves for £29. I mean, antennas have gone up in price due to the price of components. But look, the Serio Tornado, Vector 4000. Some of these are still made to this day. Look, the Serio 2012, 69.95. You'd be hard pushed to buy anything for that money now, like, of that type of antenna. So, Serio, good to see they're still around. The Serio Boomerang. What did surprise me is, like I say, there's so many antennas that are in this catalogue that are still produced now. The Solacon A99 at £59. Um, Shakespeare Army Big Stick as well, £79.95. I used to have one of them. A lot of people didn't like them, but I thought it was quite a good antenna at the time. I had good results with mine. Um, but yeah, they were very unusual, but still a very long antenna in two sections. Then they had the three section variant over this side here as well for £65. Um, again, no longer available. Uh, but yeah, lots of different antennas there. Um, the Les Wallen uh, modulators, still on the go in various formats now. Like the Scarlet Warrior that we did the review on last year. And Fire Sticks and things like that as well. But uh, yeah, the prices were a lot, lot cheaper. I mean, um, yeah, crazy. K40 as well. A much sought after antenna at the time there. Complete kit for £42.50. Some quarter waves. Yeah, now available by normal postal delivery. Even now they're a bit of a problem to get delivered, things like quarter waves sometimes. Little couriers won't touch them. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a really good uh, trip down memory lane when you see the antennas in here. But a lot of them are still basically being produced nowadays. So antenna tech hasn't really changed that much. Obviously, there are some newer antennas, but um, yeah, not... Uh, not, not, not so different from the 1990s, so 30 years have gone by and some things have advanced, like CB radio techs changed a little bit, um, you get a lot more for your money, but the antennas are basically the same, but just more expensive these days, as you can imagine, but uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, just going, moving on, uh, linear amplifiers, Zetagi B300P, 149 pounds, was later reduced, I think, in the other catalogue, I'll have a quick look at that in a minute. Uh, TVI filters and stuff like that. How could we forget? TVI used to be a big problem in the 80s and 90s with the CB radio. Not so much these days because more people have cable and satellite TV, so we don't really get as much interference anymore. And, of course, uh, 
back in the 90s. Um, you could only use FMCB legally, and you certainly couldn't use these linear amplifiers. These were for amateur radio use. Yeah, right. Of course, amateurs only use these ones. Yeah, I mean, they were all targeted at CB when you look at the frequency range of them. But, of course, they weren't... Um, they weren't approved for use on CB. Ham International, another brand that disappeared around 92, I think it was. I don't know. I'm not quite sure when that disappeared and ceased trading. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people used to swear about by uh, Ham International. Of course, Lem. But Zetagi's still producing the same old models now, really. Not much difference there, 30 years later. I mean, in, in if you imagine if this was computer technology, the things had moved on so much in 30 years. But in amateur radio and radio terms and CB... A lot of designs don't really change much over the time. They're still tried and tested. Um, obviously power meters. Uh, every CB must have had an Altai SWR meter at one point in their lives. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny looking back through some of these things. Well, an antenna switch is an antenna switch. Frequency counters like those. Uh, Zetagi Transmatch. Yeah. Not really keen on the Zatagi range of uh, products, really, when it comes to metering. Um, but that's just my personal preference. Um, yeah, frequency counters, you name it, the switches. But yeah, I mean, there's some fantastic stuff in here. And of course, sadly, sadly, this page here with the static teardrop. Um, the 575 M6 teardrop. Look at that, £48. Can you believe you could buy one for that price back then? And now look at what battered old models are fetching on eBay for like 150 quid sometimes. Some crazy people out there who want to live on to the, uh, you know, keep a piece of nostalgia. Um, I mean, yeah, they were a great, uh, great microphone and everything, but um, you wouldn't want to pay today's crazy prices for a battered old one. Uh, one or two of these models are still around now. Um, Silver Eagle, 89 quid, brand new. Yeah. It's hard to believe uh, the choice of CB gear that was around back then. Um, just flicking through a few more. They'd sold scanners back then as well. The AOR AR3000A. Wow. Sam June ATS 803A. Used to have one of them for shortwave listening. They were great. How much was the AOR? No, it didn't give you a price on that one. They were expensive. I know that back then. And of course, um, the AR2000 scanner as well. No prices quoted on there. They must have been very new back then. I think it was around 91. I ended up with one of those. And it was about, about 300, 400 pounds, I think. It was quite expensive. Can't quite remember, to be honest. But yeah, lots of different antennas for scanning. And various other bits and pieces. They did TVs and voltage droppers and all sorts of other stuff. But yeah, that was the 5th edition catalogue. And then if we moved on slightly to the 8th edition, which is the other one I've got here. Um, that was kind of crazy. Um... I think this is around 90, oh, yeah, 98, I think this one was. So this is a later 90s one. And they've got a whole load of different stuff in here as well. Some slightly newer radios started appearing, like the Midland 48 Plus 80 channel for £109. Um, yeah, I'm going to get on to the interesting stuff in a minute. I believe there's some exports in there. There was the uh, Jessan 900 base station as well. Had one of them a uh, long, long time ago as well. Uh, reduced to clear at £99. Wow. Um, yeah, rubber duck antennas. There is a section on one of these in here. There's obviously coaxial cables as well. They did a lot of the uh, JSC wire and cable uh, stuff from the United States. They were very good quality cables. They had things like the uh, Mini 8, which a lot of CB has used. Things like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, even back then... Decent cable wasn't exactly cheap, but it's obviously gone up a lot more since them days. Um, interference filters again. Yeah, uh, linear amplifiers. I noticed that um, the Tatagi B300P was much more expensive in the early 90s, and then this catalogue in 1998, uh, down in price, look at that, it dropped to £89 for the uh, Tatagi 300 watt linear amplifier. So it did come down about £50 over that period of time. So yeah, some things were beginning to drop in price by the later part of the 90s, which is quite interesting. But um, yeah, um, I won't go through all of those because there's so much stuff in here. But yeah, the catalogs were always really well produced with Truck King. That's what I liked about them. Obviously the mag mounts and things like that as well that they did. Um, there's my antenna, I've still got it. The Serio Megawatt 4000. And um, how much was it? It was 
£29. Even now you can get it for about £35 even now. So in real terms, it's come down in price again since the 1990s when you consider inflation and everything. Still a class act, antenna, hard to beat. Um, still use one to this day. I've got one of the original ones from the uh, late 90s that I uh, showed in one of my videos when I did that Scarlet Warrior review as well. Now this one here is quite interesting. They've got the Serio... Um, 2012 antenna again here and I've noticed it says up the top corner they're not legal for UK use on the CB frequencies that was because um, the radio communications agency at the time used to uh, have a special clause on the CB radio regulations that said you couldn't run antennas bigger than a certain size and some antennas were not legal because they had too much gain on them so it's kind of ridiculous when you think about it now. I mean, all those restrictions were eventually removed for CB. And of course, now look at us. We've got AM, FM, SSB and everything. But in them days, you had to be careful what antenna you ran as well. Um, because the uh, legality was as such that you could get uh, into trouble for running one of these antennas with a little bit too much gain for your UK FM radio. Absolutely crazy when you think about it. But uh, that's how things were in the 1990s. Um, yeah, wall brackets. The Solarcon A99 which had already changed its name, I think, from Antron 99 in the late 90s. Look at that, £58. I don't think you can buy one for that price now, brand new, either. So moving on slightly, here's another catalogue from CRT of France. Obviously, CRT still going strong to this very day, making some cracking uh, export radios with the help of our Chinese manufacturing friends. But uh, this is the 1995 catalogue that I got in a box with a Superstar 3900 when I bought it brand new. And... Uh, yeah, the, the marketing was quite slick, really, I suppose, in the 90s for uh, some of these things. Quite nice full-colour catalogue and everything. And they usually feature the young lady on the front in most of their uh, literature to advertise CB radio, as uh, a lot of dealers did back then. I think the only one that tends to get away with that these days is uh, maybe Thunderpole. They still tend to do some of that kind of stuff. So they're still living the 90s dream. But anyway, if we have a look at that, I mean, obviously CB in the 80s and 90s was filled with uh, young ladies advertising uh, CB radios, twiddling knobs and things, so to speak. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is uh, all in French, this catalogue, but you get the gist of it. The same radios are available in the UK, obviously to UK standards at the time. The S-Mini AM and the AM and FM version as well there for the continent. And uh, getting on to some of the more interesting radios up here. Now, these were the good ones. Uh, the CRT Ulysses. And the, of course, iconic Superstar 3900 um, in production for many, many years. Obviously, the old Cobra 148 and the design language translated through. Very, very uh, much similarities on the boards and everything in them. Until recent times when, of course, the Chinese did their own take on the Superstar 3900, which is currently available. And uh, still has the same classic look with the knobs and the chrome and the bezel and everything. So, uh, obviously, still a big seller, even now, with truckers and everybody else who likes the old retro-style radios. Um, CRT Galaxy Pluto. Yeah, again, another radio loosely based around the 3900. Superstar 360 in black. And the Connex as well. As you'll see, that uh, if you're an American viewer, some of these radios will be familiar to you under different names as well, because they've all been rehashed several times for the different markets across the world that's kind of interesting one that is and of course then some of the ones that uh, we all used to dream about in the 1990s things like the galaxy saturn base um might be very familiar to uh, a lot of you guys in the states as well uh very nice looking radio under a few different names again there was high power versions of these ones as well this one quotes am and fm 8 watts am fm 20 watts ssb and there's the Hercule base, which is basically a range of 2950 in a base station, as it says there. So it's got the power supply built in and everything. So you've got your Ranger 2950, which was also an iconic radio back in the 90s. I had several of those with the different colour displays. Never actually acquired the Hercule base because it was so expensive. And there is, a, as it says there, a version export 26 to 32 megs, basically just a wide-banded version of the one above. Any of those could be modified to cover all those frequencies. And on this side of the page... The Ranger uh, RCI 2950, or should I say the CRT 2950, obviously made by Ranger Corp. There you go. Again, available in the export. Pretty much iconic radios at the time. 
a little bit more advanced than the President Lincoln or the Uniden 2830, obviously, a bit bigger display in the car and everything if you needed that kind of thing. All cracking radios, then some handholds here as well. Uh, but yeah, you're surprised really, yeah. Uh, yeah, CRT have been importing a lot of stuff for years and rebranding and everything, as you can see. And um, the uh, microphones, power supplies, etc. Really good stuff. Some big, chunky, uh, linear-type power supplies. None of your switch mode rubbish. <laughs> Way a ton, they do. I like carrying a brick around, which is why they've got a big uh, carrying handle on top of them as well. And uh, voltage droppers. And little linear amplifiers as well. Obviously uh, rebranded again. So yeah, there you go. Look, CRT Aesthetic D104. Obviously they carried some of the uh, Aesthetic range as well. And some speakers, etc. So yeah, CRT did an awful lot of stuff, including antennas and kits and things like that. Discones. Yeah, look at these. But yeah, nice, uh, nice colour glossy catalogue, even now. And it's kept in good condition, considering how old it is. Almost 30 years ago. There's an antenna rotator. Believe it or not, they still sell stuff like that these days. All that looks the same as this thing. Straight out of the 1980s. But if it does the job, I suppose. Yeah, a lot of these things have a very long production uh, uh, life and everything. As you can see there. The adapters and everything else. But yeah. So that was another of the catalogues there. I've also got a Zatagi catalogue here from Nevada. Wow. All the Zatagi product range with the uh, big power supplies that they used to do. They used to do some quite nice looking power supplies actually. Quite uh, good quality and everything. Professional line. Even expensive back then. There's no prices quoted in this catalogue but um, yeah obviously a lot of stuff there. Uh, the interesting part is this linear amplifier section. Obviously, some of these are still made to this day. The target is still using the same classic design and everything, still manufacturing them. And uh, I had to laugh when I got to this section here. Look at this B750. Uh, that, that beast there has got like a fan on top of it to keep it cooler as well. And um, I don't know if they still make that one now, to be honest. I'll have to look it up. But uh, that's some very, very big. I mean, let's face it, Italy is responsible for uh, some of the world's most powerful stations. Uh, they all use power in Italy. Uh, one kilowatt, etc., etc. You hear them on the bands day in, day out, across most of Europe and probably into the United States as well and around the world. Because the Italians do love to run power sometimes. I don't see many QRP Italian CB stations, to be honest with you. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. Some of the valve-type amplifiers as well. And... Uh, tube amps as they say yeah look at those <laughs> but yeah so some really good stuff in those catalogues and that's from around the uh, mid 90s as well so i've had a few of those and that brings me on to um another catalog before we look at these two books here waters and stanton before they uh, joined forces uh with nevada and everybody else uh this is a 1998 catalog which is the uh Oldest one I can find, obviously still 90s, but a bit later on in the time. But they did these beautifully uh, glossy catalogues at one time before the internet and full colour pictures and everything, you know, and uh, there was all sorts in them. I mean, you could spend hours. I mean, I think you had to pay for these, didn't you? I mean, if you were lucky, you got one sent to you for free, but they were £2.95. They were well worth the money for the production quality and everything. Beautiful full colour guide uh, back in the 90s and things like, you know, not just that, there was reviews inside them, information. All that kind of stuff. You know, Cushcraft beams. You name it. It was all in there. And um, everything you needed in one catalogue. But they were really, really good. Uh, some of the pictures made me laugh like now of the uh, computer operator there. Like and that on that uh, computer controlled HF transceiver. I'm just looking at the uh, computer and uh, thinking back to when I used to have one that looked a bit like that. I think everything used to be a beige box and a CRT monitor back then. So a lot of things have changed. Obviously, radio equipment doesn't change quite as much. But, um, yeah, there was all sorts of kits in here. All kinds of stuff. Great information. ADI communications. Yeah, I remember them. Yeah, lots of amateur radio stuff as well. And even digital cameras they used to sell. Things like that. But, um, yeah, it's been a really good thing to look back. But this is a good uh, section here. What would you have bought in the 90s for around a grand... The ICOM 706 Mark II was available at £1,195. That price was correct on the 1st of October 1997. And here's the Kenwood TS50. I always loved the TS50. 
bought a few of them second hand. £1,059. I mean, you think in real terms how much your radio has come down so much because you think you could buy the ACO FT710 for that money now and look how much more advanced it is with its Spectrum Scope, SDR and everything else. And yet back then you'd just get a basic functional uh, mobile transceiver, which was good. Don't get me wrong, the TS50 was a cracking transceiver. Had some brilliant audio, but the features were very, very basic. And of course, then the nearest competitor to it was also the, uh, I think it was the Alinco DX70. I don't know if we can find that. Maybe that'll be on this next page here. Let's have a little look. Um, yeah, there we go. Alinco DX70 Mobile HF. And that was £685, so it was somewhat cheaper than the Kenwood. And in some respects, it was very, very similar. So Alinco was um, basically like a budget alternative to Kenwood at the time. But also, not forgetting Yesu, the FT920, for around 1,699 quid. Wow. And of course, the Yesu FT1000MP was pretty much top line back then. £2,500. Can you believe that? In the 90s. So, in real terms, that's, um, yeah... It would be a lot more money these days if it was still, you know, in line with inflation. But now we know that for that money, you can buy a lot more, um, you know, a lot more radio for the uh, money. FT900 had one of those, £1,299. And of course, yeah, all these different rigs that were out back then. So amateur radio gear has definitely fallen in price since those days. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to uh, look around. Two books I found in my collection, the British CB book by Peter Chippendale. This is a fantastic book. Um, every now and again they come up on eBay, getting quite vintage these days. But uh, if you're into CB radio and want to know a bit about the history of CB in the UK, its origins from the illegal days of AM to the legalisation of FM, then grab yourself a copy of this book maybe. There's two here that I can recommend thoroughly. Uh, this one by Peter Chippendale, the British CB book, and this one here, CB as Bible. And these were specifically written for the British markets, obviously, when CB was a big craze uh, in the 1980s and into the 90s. I think this was written in 81 and this was possibly 82. And um, yeah, they're both worth a pickup if you can find a decent uh, quality copy on eBay or something like that. Uh, I mean, these were just uh, brilliant. Uh, they tell you everything. Beginner's Guide, How to Speak on CB, Handles and all the rest of it, AM and FM, Sideband, DXing, Ham Rules buying equipment obviously a lot of the stuff is now um outdated in there but the theory and everything behind everything is still the same as it always was so i mean you know there's a lot of good information inside there if we just have a quick flick into there it shows you about uh, the history of cb which is really good because a lot of people won't even know about any of this m and fm conversion um antennas how to mount them that kind of thing really really good Oh, look at that there, how we mostly started off. Um, like, that's a fire stick on a biscuit tin there. Uh, I think I had the DV27 on the biscuit tin, which was pretty much the standard around this area. Everybody used to recommend those. But yeah, uh, sort of like a semi-effective ground plane for indoor use. And uh, look at that. Oh, an illegal radio station back in the 80s with a ham international jumbo base station there. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all sorts. Um, really good technical terms, but it's well worth a pick up this book. It's got all the 10 codes in it and everything else, and the Q codes, the 13 codes, which was known as the insult codes, and all the different uh, town names around the UK as well, when they used to use uh, slang and everything on the CB. Absolutely crazy. A bit of history. Pick one of those up if you can find one. Uh, they do go for some good money now if you get one in decent condition. CB is Bible again. Same sort of thing. Q code signals. Uh, breaker channels it used to tell you all the different breaking channels in the UK when there used to be people on the CB and uh, all that kind of stuff so yeah it's really really good and it's a little piece of history so I'm so glad I found these when I was clearing out and I'm going to keep hold of these and look after them because who knows in another 20 years time they could be worth a fortune if they're around the other thing was I was a member of the Delta Tango group in the 1990s and there's my uh, certificate of membership as you used to get one of these things when you joined I was a member of a few different DX groups, uh, never joined the ATs like Alpha Tangos, but I did join the Delta Tango group, and this was my certificate. I was Unit 1311. Whatever happened to the Delta Tango group? I don't know. If anybody knows, uh, do drop a comment, because um, I've been trying to find out, and uh, what actually happened to them, I, I don't really know in the end. Beside a bit of a break from radio myself, then came back and I noticed that they uh, completely disappeared, and there's not many references to them around these days. So if anyone knows about the Delta Tango group and what happened, 
do let me know. But uh, they were quite good. I also joined the Yankee Bravos, Yorkshire Breakers, I think it was. But uh, yeah, and I also found these in between the books. And this one, which you'll all be familiar with, President still put one of these in the box with most new CB radios. If you're buying brand new, you tend to get one of these. Number one CB present sticker to put on something or other, like the back of your car or something. Like, nobody does that anymore these days. But this is the rarest one of all. I found this one. Number one CB Emperor. Now, notice the similarity between the two. That's because Emperor was a subdivision of President, and they used to make radios like the Emperor Shogun. Now, the Emperor Shogun is where I got this one from. I bought a brand new one from, I think it was Waterford Communications in Ireland back in the 90s. And, uh, yeah, Emperor was the budget range of uh, basically CB radios that President produced. Like, um, instead of the President name, they had the Emperor name because they weren't manufactured by Uniden. Because at one time, President used to be exclusively Uniden. So anything else uh, that wasn't Uniden came under the Emperor name. So it's a little bit of... Uh, uh, facts and trivia for you there anyway so if you ever see that one that's quite a rare sticker so i'll definitely be keeping hold of that one there and uh, everything on this table because i thought it was quite interesting to look back through uh, some of these things so that about wraps it up for this video hopefully you guys have enjoyed looking at some 90s nostalgia and maybe you've got some of your own memories so if you'd like to uh, drop some comments under the video let me know what you remember about cb radio in the 1990s if you were on the air back then or even amateur radio for that matter because i find it all fascinating and it's great that i've come across all these when i did that clear out in the garage i was hoping to find the night cb radio catalogs but i haven't found those yet i have got some somewhere so i will try and dig them out and uh, maybe include them in a future video at some point but hopefully you enjoyed that uh, let us know anyway and if it's popular we'll do another feature like this sometime in the future but for now stay safe happy new year once again guys and we'll catch you on the air very shortly 73 